I'm very pleased to introduce our very first speaker, uh, Teva Regal. Uh, Teva was raised in the Orthodox Church and has been an active member for all her life. For the past 20 years, her work has focused on the ministry of women in the church. For over 15 years, she has served as the managing editor of the St. Nina Quarterly, uh, a publication dedicated to exploring the ministry of women in the Orthodox Church and to cultivate a deeper understanding of ministry in the lives of all Orthodox uh, Christian women and men. She is also an Orthodox consultant for a number of consultations on men and women in the church, sponsored by the World Council of Churches. Uh, a lifelong student of theology, she completed her Masters of Divinity at Holy Cross School, uh, Greek Orthodox School of Theology in 2007 graduating with distinction and has um, received now her PhD in liturgical theology from Boston College, where you're also teaching currently, if I recall. And she also, also works full time at MIT. Uh, so. um, we're very honored to have her. Teva has spoken internationally on multiple topics and has written, and uh, I'm sure we will be edified today. Thank you. Thank you. introduction. I'm very um, pleased and honored to be here with you and I hope that our afternoon together is fruitful and uh, enriching in your own lives as well. And before I uh, would begin my, remark my remarks, I would like to call to your attention some of the uh, pieces in the packet. You will find here the one sheet that is essentially the outline of my comments today. And if you would like to follow along, in other words, gee, when is she going to finally end? Okay, she's about to end now, <laughs> that kind of thing, that you will be able to at least get the highlights in terms of what I intend to say from my remarks. Uh, secondly, another very important piece of uh, labor in your packets is this very, this very extensive calls for the rejuvenation of the female diaconate in the modern era. This is a front and back on your, in your packet here, and I will reference this during my talk as well. But if you would like to kind of read and follow along in some of the comments, this is available to, for you to do so. And it's also available to, to realize that this is not a new question in our church. It's something that has been going on for, as I will mention, over 100 years, and it has been extensively studied. So we're not totally breaking totally new ground here. Um, I would also like to draw your attention to other pieces of information that may be helpful, perhaps when you go home, to read. One is a short article that we put together called Towards a Reasoned and Respectful Conversation about the Deaconesses. This was written as a cooperative effort by members of the St. Phoebe Board, and it was meant to address some of the questions that are currently out there in terms of the debate, and it allows us to set, hopefully, kind of a base ground rule for how we then can respectfully discuss, discuss this particular issue. And, and lastly, if you're ever so inclined, this is a wonderful, um, list that we provided for further reading of a number of books that address the topic and an annotated bibliography telling a little bit about each book. So there's plenty of information for um, if you would like to look further and also in particular today the two sheets of paper that might be helpful as we follow along uh, my remarks. So I would like to begin with the second prayer of ordination of the female deacon in the Byzantine Rite. And it says, Master and Lord, you do not reject women who offer themselves and by divine counsel to minister as is fitting to your holy houses, but you accept them in the order of ministers. Give the grace of your Holy Spirit to the servant of yours also, who wishes to offer herself to you and to accomplish the grace of the diaconate as you gave the grace of your diaconate to Phoebe, whom you called to the work of ministry, grant her, O God, to preserve without condemnation in your holy churches, to give careful attention to her way of life, to chastity in particular, and show her to be your perfect servant, that when she stands before the judgment of Christ, 
she may also receive the fitting reward of her way of life." Unquote. So the female diaconate has been part of our history, and for nearly a thousand years the Orthodox Church ordained women as deaconesses. And as the Orthodox theologian and author of Women Deacons in the Orthodox Church, Dr. Kiri Ki Kari Doyanas Fitzgerald writes, and I quote, according to the Byzantine liturgical texts, the ordination of a woman deacon occurred as any other ordination to major orders. It took place during the celebration of the Eucharist and at the same point in the service that the male deacon was ordained. She was ordained at the altar by the bishop and later in the service received communion at the altar with the other clergy. And depending on the need, location, and situation in history, the deaconess ministered primarily to women in the community in much the same way as the male deacon ministered to men. And she continues, the order grad was gradually de-emphasized sometime after the 12th century. And it should be noted, however, that there does not exist any canon or church regulation that opposes or suppresses the order. End quote. So for over, over 100 years, various voices within the church have called for the restoration of the female diaconate. But what is the diaconate? What is its function in the life of the church and its relationship to the other ordained ministries? What did the female deacon do? We know some of the roles of the historical deaconess. Lay women are today filling many of those functions. So is it still necessary then to have an ordained ministry? Is a permanent diaconate, especially a female diaconate, needed in the church today? These are some of the questions, some of the issues that surround this question today. And although not exhaustive, my remarks will begin to explore them. I will then end my presentation by addressing what I think is the most important question in this debate. How can reviving this ministry benefit the church? How can it build up the body of Christ for today? So the diaconate. Let me begin with the fundamental assertion that there is only one ministry in the church, and that is Christ's ministry. We are all called to participate in it. And in fact, we are all ordained, if you will, into the ministry of Christ, the royal priesthood, at our baptism and chrismation. And it is here that we are anointed as priest, prophet, and king, participating in the life of the priest, prophet, and king. During the second and third centuries within this royal priesthood, the threefold ministry of bishop, what we now know as bishop, presbyter, and deacon, emerges as the pattern of formal ministry, ordained ministry, within the church. So how are the three expressions that we, of what we call priesthood, the bishop, presbyter, and deacon, understood, and how do they relate to one another? According to the understanding of the church, the bishop, or the episcopos, is the overseer of the community. He is the center of our visible unity. And as John Chrysogee says, the spokesman for traditional doctrine, unquote. The priest or presbyter serves the local community. He is the minister of the word and sacrament. And it is through his hands that we offer our sacrifice of praise to God and from, and from whose hands we encounter the peace of Christ in our liturgy. The deacons exemplify the interdependence of worship and service in the church's life. Historically, the diaconate has been a ministry that is focused on service and has included pastoral care of the faithful, philanthropic outreach, reading the scriptures and at times preaching, and other forms of liturgical service. For instance, preparing the offering for the people or feeding, um, leading the petitions for the concerns of the people or taking communion to the sick as well as ecclesial administration. So in particular, it is grounded in the way that the church meets the world. So the diaconate in history, biblical times. The church's ministry, modeled after Christ's example, grew out of the needs of the community. In the early church, the Hellenists complained that their window, widows were being neglect, neglected in the daily food distribution, an important part of the philanthropic work of the early church. And the apostles realized that they could not attend to both the word of God and serve tables, so the, according to the account in Acts, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, they sought out, and I quote, seven men of good standing, full of spirit and wisdom, whom they may appoint to this task, unquote. 
And this has traditionally, traditionally marked the embryonic of what we call the office of the deacon. Later, the first place where we can find the word deacon is used as a title in Romans. St. Paul writes to the Romans and says, and I quote, I commend you, our sister Phoebe, a deacon, in Greek diakonon, of the Church of Cancre, unquote. Although some have argued that this passage only refers to Phoebe as a helper, the writings of both Origen and St. John Chrysostom show that the patristic tradition upholds Phoebe's position as a deaconess. And in addition, Chrysostom also understands the reference to women in St. Paul's first letter of Timothy, 1 Timothy um, chapter 3, verse 11, where he outlines the duties of the bishop, presbyter, and deacon in the nascent church and to refer to the female deacons, not just women generally. He says that Paul is speaking of women who have the, quote, dignity or authority of the diaconate. So we see already from biblical times a reference to the female deacon. So let's now move to the early church. We have evidence of the existence of deaconesses and deacons in the early church as well. Now in a secular text, one of the letters from Pliny, who was the governor of Bithynia, to Trajan in the year 112, and he, got, he asks for guidance on how to handle this Christian sect, and he writes, quote, I have to place these two women that they call deaconesses under torture, unquote. So here we have an outside attestation to an actual existence of deaconesses in the early church. And in addition, we have evidence of the existence of male and female deacon and a general understanding of the function of each from early church documents. We know that each was, each was answerable to the bishop. And while the male deacons ministered to men, the female deacons ministered mostly to the women. And moreover, each also had a liturgical role although the deaconess generally exercise this in the more private realm. This parallelism can be seen in a, um, an early church text called the Apostolic Constitutions, which is a fourth or fifth century document of, it's of Syrian origin that outlines early church ethics and liturgics. So we know a lot about that time from these particular texts. And in it, it outlines the character of the deacon, and I quote, so let the deacons be in all things unspotted, as the bishop himself is to be, only more active, that they may minister to the infirm, and let the deaconess be diligent in taking care of the women, for instance, taking communion to them, to the sick as well. Both, but both be ready to carry messages, to travel about, to minister, and to serve." End quote. This reflects an earlier understanding of the functions of the office that can be found in another early church text, text called the Didascalia Apostolorum, and this is earlier in the 3rd, 4th century, and it outlines a lot of historical, um, pastoral practice, church practice at the time. So the eight books of the Didascalia Apostolorum were actually subsequently incorporated into the Apostolic Constitution, so there is some overlap there, but we can see a growth in their understanding of the ministries of the church. And it says the Didascalia contains sections on the character of the deaconess and her ministry of assisting in the baptism of women and of instructing women converts. In addition, it contains sections for both the deacon and the deaconess, advising each to care for the people, what we might call today pastoral care, and to work closely with the bishop. The Byzantine period. So during the Byzantine period, the diaconal office in the East, and especially that of women, flourished. We can see this by a number of women deacon saints on our liturgical calendar including Saints Macrina, the sister of Gregory and Basil, commemorated on July 19th, Nona, the wife of Gregory of Nazianzus, commemorated on August 5th, Olympias, who was a good friend and confidant of St. John Chrysostom, commemorated on July 25th, Xenia, the Merciful, on January 24th, Irene of Christovalantu on January, or July 28th, and um, as late as the 10th century here and etc. There are many more names, but those I just suggest as, as examples to us. In addition, we have descriptions of the makeup of the clerg clergy serving during the liturgy at Hagia Sophia that include, quote unquote, 40 deaconesses. During this time, the male diaconate in the, in the East also grew in prominence. They held high positions in church governance, including participating in ecumenical councils, for instance, Athanasius of Alexandria, Deacon and secretary for the bishop was at the Council of Nicaea in 325. 
They also served as emissaries and ambassadors at the Episcopal seat in diplomatic matters. Moreover, they were administrator, administrators of church-run homes for the poor and widows, orphanages, and hospitals. In general, the permanent diaconate in the West, however, seems to have disappeared sometime between around the 5th and the 7th century. And although I could find no stated reason for its decline, the ministry of the various monastic orders in the West most likely supplanted that of the deacon. The female diaconate in particular had not been as widely accepted in the West as in the East. And unlike the East, where there are no canons that ever suppress the order, some local councils in the West actually prohibited it. The first council of Orange in 441 stated that, quote, any new deaconesses are absolutely not to be ordained, unquote. And in 533, the Council of Orleans virtually suppressed the order. And it should be noted that the Council of Orange also demanded clerical celibacy. Um, these councils are not recognized by the Orthodox Church as having ecumenical import. In other words, they are not um, something that we find authoritative. The decline of the order in the East. The order of the female diaconate began to decline in the East sometime after around the 12th century. By this time, there were fewer adult baptisms, so female deacons were no longer needed at initiation. In addition, in late Byzantium, the rise of influence of Levitical rules, especially those regarding women, led to the perception that the shedding of blood made a woman unclean, and therefore unable to enter the sanctuary or participate in the liturgical life of the church. It should be noted that this is in direct contradiction to the understanding of uncleanness found in those early church documents that I just mentioned. It should also be noticed that those, if any of you are from the Church of Antioch, they have actually formally abrogated um, this understanding of uncleanness. And women can both take communion and go into the church anytime they're menstruating or um, after childbirth, etc. With the rise of Islam and subsequent fall of the eastern part of the Roman Empire to the Ottomans, the church turned inward. It could no longer participate in many of the philanthropic aspects of its ministry. Moreover, many of the traditional duties of the male deacon were being assumed by the priest and by a growing number of what we call so-called minor orders. And these led to hollowing out the position, and it is perceived as more of a transitional one, on the way to steps to being a presbyter. And although the male deacon retains his role in the liturgical assembly, the office has greatly devolved. Unfortunately, this is what typically, typically remains of the order in the East today. In modern times, the deaconate actually has experienced a great renewal and rejuvenation, and most notably, and I would say somewhat ironically, in Western Christian churches. And I do explore this in a longer version of this particular paper, but it's a little bit beyond the scope today, so I'll just focus on our um, topic at hand. But in the Oriental East, I want to mention, the deacon is being revived as well. And according to a report from the Oriental Orthodox Roman Catholic Theological Consultation held at St. Nearsus Armenian Seminary in 2003, Father Simeon Adabej Bajian of the Armenian Church stated, and I quote, that the ancient societal roles of the deaconesses are being revived in the Armenian tradition, unquote. In addition to the central role they play in the liturgical services of the Armenian church, their duties include training children and altar servers, and it should be noted that in some Armenian churches they now allow girls to serve in that capacity as well, visiting the sick and taking responsibility for parish administration. The ordination of the female deacon is also part of the history of the Armenian church and is also being revived. According to a report from the Discerning of the Times Conference for Orthodox Women held in Istanbul in 1997, his Beatitude Patriarch Karakin II mentioned that the Armenian Apostolic Church had, quote, taken the initiative in ordaining women to the order of the diaconate in order in which both men and women are ordained and perform similar duties, unquote. At this same meeting, it was reported that the Archbishop Mesrob Metapremian, the patriarchal vicar for ecumenical relations, spoke of the traditional practice of the Armenian church to ordain women to the diaconate. And the consultation report says, and I quote, there is no difference between the ordination service for women and men, the women deacons care for orphans, assist women in baptism, serve liturgically at the altar, read the gospel, and bring the host to the priest. And at this time, women deacons 
come from the monastic tradition, unquote. Interestingly, I should note that last year in the Armenian church ordained a non-monastic woman in Iran with the understanding that she would get married in the future if she so desired, as is the custom of the Armenian church. So in the Armenian church, you don't have to be married prior to being ordained to, at the diaconate level. As long as you state that you would like that to be a possibility in your life, um, you are allowed to get married after ordination prior to, and if you ever then go uh, be ordained, if you ever then are ordained to the presbytery, you have to be married beforehand. Anyway, they operate slightly differently than we do in the Byzantine Orthodox. In the Byzantine East, especially in the United States, the male deacon diaconate is growing. Train, pro training programs have been established to train candidates, and in some places, male deacons are assuming more responsibility for the pastoral care and the philanthropic work of the community. However, in other places, the ministry is still exercised either as an interim step prior to ordination to the presbytery or solely as a liturgic functionary. The female diaconate has not yet been revived. There have been numerous attempts for over 100 years to reinstitute the female diaconate in the Orthodox Church. And here again, I direct you to the, um, the outline um, in your packet. As early as 1855, the sister of Tsar Nicholas I tried to restore the office. Other prominent Russians also lobbied for its restoration, including Alexander Gomolevsky and Mother Catherine, who is the um, Countess of Amovsky. According to numerous sources, in 1905 and 06, several bishops, archbishops, metropolitans of the Russian Orthodox Church encouraged this effort. And according to a report on the consultation of Orthodox women in Agapia in 1976, this issue was to be a major topic in the Council of the Russian Church beginning in 1917. But due to the political turmoil in Russia at the time, this council's work was not addressed. This is right at the cusp of the revolution. So the only thing that council was able to do was to reestablish the patriarchate in the Russian church before they had to essentially dissolve because uh, the Bolsheviks were at the door. Other efforts were made in Greece. On Pentecost Sunday in 1911, Archbishop, now Saint Nectarios, ordained a nun to the diaconate to serve the needs of her monastery, and in particular to serve in the liturgy by reading the gospel, saying petitions, and distributing communion. More recently, the issue has been discussed at a number of international conferences. The first of these was held primarily for Orthodox women in Agapia, Romania, in 1976 where the restoration of the female diaconate was unanimously recommended. This was followed by a meeting in Sofia, Bulgaria in 1987 that continued to urge, quote, a, a serious consideration of this issue. And then in 1988, the most substantive gathering to discuss the quote unquote ordination of women and the event that we are commemorating today was held in Rhodes, Greece. This conference was called by the Ecumenical Patriarch Demetrius I and was part of the pre-conciliar work of what was to have been the Great and Holy Council of the Orthodox Church at the time. It was attended by approximately 70 people and included official church delegates, including many priests and bishops, and expert advisors from the Eastern Orthodox Churches from all over the world, with the exception of the Patriarchs of Antioch and Jerusalem. It was originally organized in response to the challenge posed to the Orthodox churches by our ecumenical partners who had begun ordaining women to ministry and it strove to articulate an Orthodox answer to this question. And while the consultation was not in favor of ordaining women to the presbytery or episcopacy for that matter, it did state, and I quote, the order of deaconesses should be revived, unquote. The consultation concluded that there was ample evidence for this ministry from apostolic times and well into the Byzantine period, that the deaconess was ordained to higher orders, what they call in Greek, um, herotonia, and that the, such a revival would, and I quote, represent a positive response to the many needs and demands of the contemporary world, unquote. Furthermore, the report suggested the possibility of opening up the so-called lower orders to women, for instance, the subdiaconate, um, tantric readers, chanters, and altar service, and the like. The consultation at Rhodes was a pivotal event, and it represents the first international orthodox consensus on the revival of the female diaconate in the modern period. 
And it is from this consensus that all subsequent conferences examining the issue have been based. So this is the consensus, was the international consensus of the church. And all the work that has been done subsequent to that has assumed that as the foundation, as the base. So we're not trying to impose anything on the church. This has already been a, de a decision, more or less, by the church to which we are trying to fill out and to come to fruition. Since that time, additional conferences have been held in Crete in 1990, Damascus, Syria in 1996, and Istanbul in 1997, at which this issue was both discussed and affirmed. Furthermore, in July of 2000, after over a year of careful review on the subject, a formal letter was sent to the Ecumenical Patriarchate, this time it was Bartholomew, by more than a dozen members of the Orthodox community in Paris, including such noted Orthodox theologians as Elizabeth Berzigel, Father Boris Brokenskoy, Olivier Clément, and Nicolas Lossky. The letter traces the history of the female diaconate and notes that the patriarch himself has stated that, and I quote, there is no obstacle in canon law that stands in the way of the ordination of women to the diaconate. This institution of the early church deserves to be revitalized, end quote. It should be noticed that the, pa the patriarch Bartholomew is a canonist by trade. He studied canon law in Rome. So this is a field of which he should know something about. <laughs> so. It also states that the order should, and I quote, involve more than a simple and archaeological reconstitution of the ancient ministry of the deaconess. It is a question of revitalization, in other words, of its realization in the context of the culture and the requirements of today, unquote. Finally, a major conference entitled Deaconesses, Ordination of Women and Orthodox Theology was held in January of 2015 in Thessaloniki, Greece. It explored the issue of the female diaconate thoroughly, from biblical, liturgical, patristic, systematic, canonical, and historical theology. So, what are the issues in this space? Historically, the first issue that was in question was whether the deaconess was, were actually ordained to higher orders. In other words, were they part of the bishop, priest, or deacon, or more akin to the subdiaconate? And in the listing of church orders and church manuals, as well as in the reception of communion, the female deacon is usually listed following the male deacon and before the subdeacon. So there, there was the confusion. You have that. And um, Dr. Valerie Harris actually has done a, a, a much work on this and to show that whether the list was actually in ascending order or descending order, the female deacon was always paired with the male deacon. So she always came afterwards, so whether it was going up or down, that, um, that they were always at the same level. The 1954 landmark study by Evangelos Theodoro from Greece, Hierotonia um, e Hieroposia ton diaconisson, which means the ordination or the appointment of deaconesses, pretty much answered um, rather conclusively this question. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, his, mark, his work showed that her ordination took place during the Eucharistic Divine Liturgy, not before the service, as would be the case for minor orders, at the same place in the service as the male deacon was ordained. It also included two prayers, for the minor orders, include two prayers as opposed to one, which is from the major order, and in particular, a prayer which called down to, um, God's divine grace. And this is only done for major orders, like when I read earlier, to, um, when I, how I started this presentation. She was also ordained at the altar by the bishop, received the orarian, or the stole, the deacon's stole, and later in the service received holy communion at the altar with the clergy. And all of these are marks of higher orders of clergy, an ordination to a higher order of clergy. And although there are people that will still quibble with some very small differences in the ordination between the male and female deacon, such as referring to Stephen versus Phoebe, or whether the female deacon was a uh, candidate was standing or kneeling at some point, for almost all scholars, the work of Theodora was rather definitive. So hopefully we can put that one to rest, that issue. The second major issue is the question of whether once admitted to the diaconate, women will necessarily be admitted to the presbytery. And this is the slippery slope. And this is still a concern for some, especially those, but not exclusively, those who have entered the church primarily because their former faith traditions have moved in this direction. However, I would argue that this concern implicitly does not recognize the diaconate as its own ministry with its own charism. 
It also neglects the history of the church when women served deacons for nearly a thousand years without like moving up, let's say. Still, we have to admit that the question is real. The canonical corpus of the church does not explicitly require that the candidate be male, only that they be baptized and not a neophyte. And interestingly, we sometimes tend to ignore that letter requirement. <laughs> um, but, not, but this is not to say that it is not assumed that the candidate would have been male, and either by the canonical corpus or the culture itself. But more recently, some theologians have tried to articulate what is called like a male character to the priesthood. Is there something ontologically or inherently male about this form of office? However, the church has yet to definitively decide this question via an ecumenical council. And it is true that a revived female diaconate will most likely bring this question to the fore. The church will then have to grapple with it, and hopefully on its own terms. Ironically, those who oppose the female diaconate because they fear it will automatically lead to the female priests implicitly acknowledge that there is actually no inherent male character to the priesthood. Still, this is not a question about the diaconate, and given the state of orthodox policy, polity, I don't think that it is a immediate issue. I used to say, wait another 500 years, I'll figure that out. So neat. Does the Orthodox Church really need a rejuvenated diaconate, and in particular, a restored female diaconate? And this has been the question posited by some. So how to help answer this question, it is instructive to understand the responsibilities of a typical parish priest. Father Alexander Garkovs from the OCA outlined a number of functions expected of today's parish priests in his milieu, and is a presentation given at the pastoral conference held at St. Tikhon's Monastery in June of 2004. And so he says, in addition to all the liturgical services that a priest does, you know, Sunday liturgies, day, any daily services, any baptisms, weddings, funerals, etc., he enumerates some of the priest's responsibilities in parish life in America. And he says, pastoral visitations, educational work, Bible study, adult study, youth work, teamwork, and with choirs, for directors, marriage preparation, marriage counseling, visit shut-ins, grief counseling, hospital visits, office work, preparing, virginity, bulletin, schedules, parish meetings, Aspects of parish administration, council meetings, budgets, it's under peer, et cetera, et cetera. So it is clear that the modern day, what we might call a job description of a priest can be overly broad. And in addition, it includes functions that have traditionally been the responsibility of the deacon. Priests who quote unquote try to do it all will not likely be able to do everything well and will soon suffer from severe burnout and not be able to help anyone. Moreover, as far back in 1953, Archbishop Michael of what was then the Greek Orthodox Church of North and South America realized that there was so much to do in each community that, quote, endeavors of these priests alone do not suffice. For should a priest wish to know, as he must, his spiritual children by name, their problems, their spiritual and moral needs, this would certainly be beyond his physical and spiritual resources, unquote. So clearly a rejuvenated diaconate, a ministry that has service as its primary focus, is actually necessary in the church today. In 1990, the consultation held at Crete, which I mentioned earlier, also emphasized the need for a fully functioned diaconate of and for both men and women. Furthermore, it thought about this. It fleshed out the ways that a ministry, that such a ministry, could benefit the church. And according to the concluding reports, the delegates emphasized, and I quote, there is an urgent need for a renewal of women's ministries, particularly the diaconate. The presence of the deacon or deaconess could lead people in prayer, give spiritual counsel, help to distribute Holy Communion where possible. The renewal of the diaconate for both men and women would meet many of the needs of the church in a changing world. Catechetical work, pastoral relations, serving the same needs for a monastic community but without a presbyter reading prayers for special occasions, performing social work, pastoral care, engaging youth and college ministry, counseling, anointing the infirm, carrying out the missionary work of the church, ministering to the sick, assisting the bishop or presbyter in liturgical services. And it concludes by saying, a creative restoration of the diaconate for women, we hope will lead in turn to the renewal of the diaconate for men." Unquote. No one person can fulfill the duties necessary for the building up of the body of Christ. 
As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, each of us has been given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In particular, I suggest that a female diaconate is needed to be able to serve fully all of the faithful. For instance, there is still a need for ministry of women to women, and especially surrounding issues of reproduction, intimacy, and abuse. Furthermore, the church could and should avail itself to the talents and gifts of one half the faithful for the building of the Christ and his body. So ordination. Today, many lay women and men do serve in diaconal ways as chaplains, spiritual directors, chanters, readers, homilists, philanthropic outreach coordinators, and parish administrators, just to name a few of the many ministries of which they are involved. However, today they do so without an ordination. So the issue for some is then, well, then why should they be ordained? In order to begin to answer this question, we must first acknowledge that the ministry of the laity is important, and we should not minimize it. But still, we ordain people in our church. So what does that mean? In general, it is a setting aside for someone for ministry, usually a particular function within the church. And unlike Roman Catholic theology, we do not believe in what's called an ontological change in ordination. And unlike most Protestant theology, we do not believe it's just a merely a functional designation. According to Metropolitan uh, John Zizioulis, one of the foremost theologians of our day, it is establishing a new relationship within the community. There's, there's certainly more to be said about that, but for now, I'll leave, that, I'll leave it there. So an ordination sets one aside for ministry and develops a new relationship within the community. It assumes that the ordained are trained to do said ministry. In other words, they have been trained, they have gone to seminary, been um, educated appropriately. It also sets up a reciprocal relationship between the church and the ordinate. The ordained carries the authority and the support of the church, but then they are also held accountable to her through the person of the bishop. In other words, there's no loose wheels. Their gifts are enlivened by the descent of the Holy Spirit during the ordination and the Eucharistic celebration, and their ministry is tied to the Eucharist as its source and as its summit. In other words, they connect people to the sacramental life of the church. Which I consider, when I teach at BC, I always say this is the value add. This is what sets us apart from our Protestant friends, is that we believe that we have today that the, the, the life and death of Jesus Christ is not just an historical reality, that we believe we can still access and encounter that through the sacramental life of the church today. That power is still accessible to us. And this is what differentiates us from our Protestant friends. So I'll leave my pontificating for now. <laughs> So what could an ordained female do de and offer the church? I think this is the most salient question. I think it's the offer in this debate. And when all is said and done, it is how the diaconal work that women are already doing in the church be enhanced by an ordination. What would this mean for building up the church? And I would like to offer four ways in which a fully functioning diaconate could benefit the church. First, by strengthening the pastoral care of the faithful and enhancing this care through the sacramental life of the church. Second, by recapturing the philanthropic dimension of liturgy. Third, by focusing on the word of God more particularly. And fourth, by connecting the pastoral, social, and liturgical dimensions of the diaconate more fully. So strengthening the pastoral care of the faithful. As I have mentioned earlier, women are serving today as chaplains in hospitals, hospices, and in other settings. They bring solace to the sick and dying through their prayers and words of comfort. However, their lay status prevents them from offering communion, or perhaps unction, to the faithful. As a deaconess, a chaplain could connect the ill and firm to the power of the sacramental life of the church. As a representative of the church, she could also bring the thoughts and prayers of the entire assembly to those in need. Furthermore, through petition in the gathered assembly, she could bring the concerns of those in need to the attention of the faithful for prayer. This connects both the sick and the dying to the community and the community to the sick and dying in ways that are tangible and life-affirming, strengthening the entire body of Christ. I have seen a need for this, in the this type of ministry in my own experience. When I was in seminary, I spent six weeks one summer at a nursing home with many Orthodox residents for my pastoral care residency. 
I had nine women and one men in my rounds. As typical in these situations, women tend to outnumber men in these um, as we get older. And as a representative from the seminary, I had some authority for my visits. They were not just social visits, important as those are. I got along well with the residents, and as my visits continued, I found out that many of them really wanted to talk. And they wanted to talk about important things in their lives. And for many women, this had to do with reproductive issues, things that um, a loss of a child, problems that they might have had with their husbands, um, anything that they would never in a million years, by the way, tell a priest. They also wanted to talk about more general concerns. If they had things that were unsettled in their lives, um, regrets they may have had, and what might lie ahead of them when they leave this world. And frankly, I took a lot of confessions. And in general, I felt totally over my head, not having received any really real training in this area. And I also felt that our encounters could have been enhanced, or would have been enhanced, had I been able to bring them the healing power of Christ through the sacraments of the church. And likewise, I would suggest that they may have felt more comforted knowing that through my intercession, a community was praying and caring for them as well. Both of these actions would more concretely manifest to them that healing in Christ is healing of mind, body, and soul, both personal and communal. Some residents had been in the nursing home for years, and others for only a short time. However, I was quite saddened to learn that none, I mean absolutely none, of them had had a pastoral visit from their parish priest or deacon in all the time that they had been there. And unfortunately, this was not the exception to the rule. So clearly there is a need for women to engage in this type of ministry in the church. Similarly, a spiritual director can provide pastoral care to many in need of guidance through their lives. And although the faithful would still receive absolution for their sins through the agency of a priest, those engaged in spiritual direction can benefit from a relationship with a trained director to help them reflect on their lives. This guidance can help to understand ourselves better in order that we may be to see our sins more clearly and open a path for repentance and growth. Additionally, it can help us move forward in our lives and to grow in a relationship with God, both individually and communally, in ways that are healthy and life-affirming. In the ecclesial realm, many of us seek guidance in the monastic context. But not all monastics are good spiritual directors by virtue of their monastic vows. And to be honest, some advice they have given can be quite dubious and damaging to those who seek it. Anecdotal evidence suggests that women particularly have been the recipient of such advice and on occasion abuse. The church could benefit from those women who are immersed in the spiritual life of the church, whether inside or outside the monastic context, who have been trained in psychology and orthodox anthropology in order to minister more fully to those in her care. An ordination would emphasize the reciprocal relationship of this ministry. Those trained and ordained in this ministry have the authority and support of the church, but they also have the responsibility to the church, and there is no loose wheels for this. We have accountability. In other words, there are no loose wheels. Recapturing the philanthropic dimension of liturgy. A rejuvenated diaconate can recapture this dimension of liturgy more particularly by connecting our service to God with the service of our neighbor. Justin the Martyr reports in the early church that all Christians contributed to the offering, each one depositing their contributions with the president of the assembly. The president would then use the offerings to take care of, quote, the orphans and those who are needy because of sickness and other cause, the captives and the strangers who sojourn among us, end quote. In the, in the east, the gifts of the faithful were deposited at the outer area, which they called to be the Skevopolakion, and they prior to the prior to the liturgy. And the deacons would then select a portion to be offered to God and carry it to the altar area at the beginning of the liturgy of the faithful, what we now today call the great entrance, where, where the priest carries, generally the priest where deacon carries the gifts. The remaining gifts would be then be blessed and be distributed to the poor, the orphans, the widows, or anyone in need. This was the responsibility of the bishop and usually done by the deacon or deaconess as an agent of the bishop. 
Now at present, the church still blesses what we call the antiterum, or in place of the gift, the, the leftover bread that is not cut out as part of the lamb for communion, for distribution to the faithful. But a fully functioning diaconate, both male and female, could help to connect our liturgy and our service to the world more fully. Focusing on the Word of God. The diaconate is ministry closely associated with the Word of God, proclaiming it in word and song. And in particular, the church could benefit greatly from those who study the scriptures, more particularly, and use their education to help edify the lives of the, those assembled. Although preaching is also an area of ministry in which some theological trained laypersons participate, it can be controversial in some places, especially when a woman is doing it. <laughs> and even in those contexts where an expansion of this ministry has been welcomed, the arrival of a new priest, with perhaps a different understanding of who can and cannot participate in this ministry, or a complaint by a disgruntled parishioner, can often trump the wishes of the silent majority and cause the person who had been participating in this ministry to be disallowed from doing so. The congregation would then be deprived of hearing their voice and the perspective they bring to the reading. As a deacon or deaconess, this would be an inherent part of their ministry. This does not mean that they would take on all the preaching duties, but it would allow another voice in a studied perspective to contribute more, more regularly to the edification of the faithful. Connecting the pastoral, social, and liturgical dimensions more fully. As I have mentioned above, the ministry of the deacon is to connect more fully the pastoral and social dimensions of Christ's work in and through the gathering of the assembly. I have intimated how a future deaconess could continue to strengthen this connection as well. However, formal and public liturgical role is the least developed area of diaconal ministry for women, as most of her ministry in antiquity, as well as almost all of her daily life, was exercised much more in the more private sphere. This is a major concern for those opposed to the revitalization of the diaconate. However, as John, De Deacon John Priest of Geese, the deacon for the Ecumenical Patriarch, reminds us, quote, the decision as to whether or not women deacons perform such public liturgical functions arguably remains the exclusive prerogative of bishops and synod in order that the Catholic mind of the church may gradually mature in and collectively seal this critical aspect of the female diaconate, unquote. In my opinion, it is a distortion of the office to have the male deacon serve only in the liturgy and not within the community, and conversely to have a female, future female deacon serve within the community but not in the liturgy. As Dr. Fitzgerald reminds us, and I quote, it is important to remember that in the past, women deacons did have important responsibilities in the Eucharistic assembly, as well as in the administration of baptism, in praying with and for those in need, and in bringing Holy Communion to those unable to attend the Eucharist. Today, these expressions of ministry can certainly continue. At the same time, we also need to examine how women deacons can participate in the Eucharist and other liturgical services in a manner which is expressive of the living tradition of the church and which is not defined by the cultural norms of another time." Unquote. In conclusion, the diaconate is a ministry of service that connects our communal gathering with the liturgy of our lives more particularly. In the divine liturgy, we offer our sacrifice of praise to God and we encounter the joy and the peace of the Trinity more fully. And as we leave our communal gathering, we continue to share this joy with others, ministering to our neighbor. And when we assemble again as the body of Christ, we bring our encounter with our neighbor, with us. Our task is to continue this dance, drawing all of life into Christ. Equipping and recognizing the diaconal ministry of men and women can help to strengthen our mission for the building up of the body and for the life of the world. Thank you.
Um, I'm going to start off with a quick question, and then we'll ask for others so you can think for a minute. <coughs> Since we're about maybe not more than a half an hour for this, because we, we do need a break. We've got to get up. We have to get Refreshments. I got so, all that wonderful food so, that she made. Yeah. Between 15 minutes and a half an hour tops. Okay. No, we're not going to let her go after 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the question I have is you traced um, the origins sort of in the east. What about Slavic lands? I mean, you, you, know, you came to later times with Slavic lands. There's a lot of resistance among Slavs for women deacons, and I'm wondering whether, like, when Ukraine Rus accepted Christianity, is there any? record of their actually bringing deaconesses in, you know, those sorts of things. Um, as, you, as Gail mentioned, the, the question of what about in Slavic lands? And... Is that, Slav. Yeah, yeah, Slav. 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 Russian, Ukrainian, Serbian. Okay. Well, were there female deacons in that, in their experience when they accepted Christianity? So they accepted Christianity around the 10th century, at least that was uh, Cyril and Methodius, and they accepted the form of Christianity uh, that they received at that time. Um, by that time, the male deacon was starting to um, lose much of its, um, much of their philanthropic um, missionary work because the, uh, the Byzantine Empire was starting to feel the pressures of the Ottoman East and things. So what, what was imported into their um, expression was two things. One, ironically, liturgically, was imported in older form of our liturgical life called the cathedral office, which was part of my own study, so I greatly appreciate, um, which employed a lot more of um, assembly participation naturally in its expression. Like people were singing petitions and a lot of more back and forth into the dialogical relationship that now tends to have been lost. This would have been an important um, work and ministry also led by the deacon itself. Um, however, it, there does not seem to be a lot of evidence of the um, female diaconate being widely um, practiced in the Slavic lands at this time. Mostly because by this time, um, most of the female uh, diaconate, which was concentrated in the East, as the West, we know the Roman Empire now had <coughs> essentially been dissolved into feudal city-states. Um, and most of that ministry had been taken over by the monastic orders. So um, I would say most of the resistance has to do because it wasn't necessarily a big part of their history. And um, however, just because something wasn't part of your own particular history doesn't mean it's not part of the history of the entire church. And so that is, um, might be a way to position that to those who don't see it immediately in their history. Great, thank you. Um, so if you have a question, Raise your hand, stand up, say your name. Oh, and they have a microphone. Oh, there's a microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so say your name and parish, and, and then quickly, you know, one or two sentences. Uh, Carrie Limbarakis, uh, Philadelphia, <clears throat> St. Sophia and St. Luke parishes, and um, Archon of the Ecumenical Patriarchy. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. When you first opened, uh, opened with your remarks as far as uh, the timing of the demise of the female diaconate. Uh, I was wondering whether there was a correlation between the demise and the fall of Byzantium, since Byzantium and the church were so closely related. And the one oppression sentence. of the, this is one sentence. <laughs> it's a word. And that was the second question, and that's the third. <laughs> Is there a correlation with the oppression of the Ottoman Empire and the low esteem held in Islam with the fall of the diaconate? Um, did everyone hear the question? The question had to do with essentially how did the diaconate, I think more generally, and the female diaconate in particular, um, uh, what was the response of that to the church because of the fall of the Byzantine Empire and the um, incursion of the Ottomans? Um, I think that the diaconate more particularly suffered because much of, we have to remember Christianity was an urban religion. It never really kind of won the hearts and minds of many people in the countryside. It was essentially centered in cities um, throughout the entire Roman Empire, okay? So it's not like they totally just wiped out the entire population when they came. And there, was already, there were already a number of 
religions, quote unquote, still in practice, although by the time of Constantine, it had been given kind of um, uh, imperial and imprimatur and became the major religion of the empire. Certainly, the idea that the, the diaconate ministry as a whole was what I call hallowed out because of its restrictions in terms of um, uh, it could no longer really function publicly. And so much of the philanthropic work of the church, which was carried out by the diaconate, was certainly severely curtailed. And this would have to do also with the, the work that women were doing. And by this time, one could also argue that most of, because of women operating more in this private sphere, that most of the diaconal work for women in the East was also done through the monastic, um, uh, in the monastic realm, let's say. Um, when Islam first came to um, uh, the lands that we now call Mediterranean, as I understand it, its understanding of women was benign. We did, it did not come as a um, fundamentalist force. Um, however, what had occurred prior to that, and I think is probably more operative to the, this debate, is kind of the re-understanding or emergence of the Levitical purity laws in the church. And this actually came much more from internally from the monastic expression of the church. So the understanding that women, because they menstruate, are unclean, and therefore not able to come near to the sacred mysteries, or even step in the altar area, et cetera, became, um, from Judaism, became very prevalent. It's totally in contradistinction to um, how we understand the gospel of Christ, but those things kind of die hard. Now those are also cross-cultural um, uh, realities. You find it in the sumo ring in Japan, you find it in all um, different realities. Uh, having said that though, I think it is important, by the way, there are pure, uh, called um, blood purity things for men as well, in terms of um, they're not allowed to serve if they had a wet dream the night before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But somehow those never got stuck. They didn't quite stick the same way. Um, it is true that I think that um, Islamic incursion, though, eventually had the um, uh, effect of repressing uh, the status of women in the society. So well, it might not have been a primary correlation initially in terms of the um, kind of devaluation of the female jack, and I think eventually it, it took on that, um, uh, let's say, it, it, took, it, it affected society in such a way. Yeah, so. Uh, actually, George is next okay. to me. No, oh, are you going to add a comment in? Yeah. Too bad. If I could, please. Um, I also think that um, in addition to the uh, ritual impurity uh, prevalence that, that you see developing in the Byzantine oh, church. Here's my phone. And, and I want you to stand up and hear your name. Yeah. Uh, Valerie Harris. Um, in addition to the ritual impurity thing, um, I'm thinking more and more these days that <laughs> It's not coincidental that the time period that we see the disappearance of the ordained female diaconate in the Byzantine church, which is after the 12th century, um, that it coincides with the period of the Latin occupation of Constantinople and most of what's left of the Byzantine Empire. Now, uh, here, uh, uh, a, a church historian named Gary Macy has done work showing that um, there were women in the Western church that were being sort of ordained together with their husbands like a shared ministry, but they didn't actually have a distinct female diaconate that was women ordained in their own right the way that we have in the East. And remember that the Latins took over the Church of Constantinople, the whole Byzantine church, for um, the better part of a century. Um, and I, I just wonder if that didn't have something to do with that. Great, thanks, Robert. George, you have the next question. Okay, I'll try to make it a question. <laughs> um, George Carcasus. George Carcasus, Saints Peter and Paul, uh, this is my home parish. Um, 30 years ago, I thought that change would happen during my lifetime, but now, now that I'm 80. My question is, how does this get done? Okay, so you have, you know, we have all these testimonials from all these people that have said that it, it was there and it should come back and so on and so forth. You made a little reference to the fact that it's up to the hierarchy. So my question is, uh, do we have to wait for a great holy council? 
Is this something that has to happen at the Holy Synod in Istanbul? Can it happen at the Eparchial Synod? Or can our new metropolitan in Chicago reinstate the female diaconate in this territory? Amen. Yeah. Such a nice question. <laughs> <laughs> um, technically, your bishop could do it tomorrow. Okay. Now, Reality, that's not going to happen because there would be severe blowback and you don't want to have a, something instituted in which there is immediately such severe blowback that it could not be happening ever happen again. Um, the church has to be ready for this, okay? Um, and women have to be ready to step into that role, okay? So part of the mission of the St. Phoebe Center is to develop both of those, okay? Um, aspects, in other words, to make sure women get the proper training so that at when the day, if it does happen, it'll be a seamless transition that would be less blessed and extend the ministry in ways that they might have already been doing and people will accept it because the church has to be able to accept whatever the bishops decide. <coughs> we don't believe that the bishops, at least theoretically in our ecclesiology, we don't believe that the bishops rule by fiat, that somehow the mind of the church has to accept it. Um, practically speaking, I think it has to be a decision of a regional synod, as was done in the Church of Alexandria um, two years ago, where they took steps in this direction by um, or ordaining what they call deaconesses to um, to something uh, akin to almost deaconesses, let's say. Uh, it does not need an ecumenical council uh, because there was would never an ecumenical council that forbid it. There was never, there's nothing in the canons that actually forbid it. So you are working within the, um, uh, within the tradition of the church. And let's remember St. Nectarios also um, did in fact uh, ordain women for his own, on his own accord um, at the time to serve particular needs. So if the needs of the church are recognized um, and women are ready to step into it, then I think it will move and happen in terms of that way. Um, Getting to that point, that's the tricky part. <laughs> and uh, I hope and perhaps pray that someday we will. Uh, let me just also add that I think it's a, also a crisis of ecclesiology in our church. I mean, there are so many issues that the bishop should be dealing with in many people's opinions that, um, and they, I think, we tend to get paralyzed. We tend to just not even do anything. You know, like somehow if we pulled out the thread, the whole ball of wax is going to, you know, come unraveled. We'd have to have strength and confidence in our own theology, in our own polity, that what we do is really um, within the tradition and discerning and guided by the Holy Spirit. And we have to continue to work because what is happening with, you know, people will say, well, the fear of schism, the fear of schism. But they fail to realize that there is already a schism. It's a silent schism. And people leave. And they go, they leave the church for many reasons. But for women, some of which is because they either are not being ministered to or they can't exercise their ministry into, in the realm of their home environment. So that is something that I think we can bring to the consciousness of our bishops, that it's not neutral. This is not a neutral thing. The status quo, everything is not just wonderful. You know, that there are issues and there are things that are not being met, especially pastoral needs uh, to and, and from the various women and women in our community. And that is their duty as our leaders to in fact help to prepare us and to move in those directions to address those needs. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Verdina Taylor. I'm here from St. Thomas the Apostle Church in Detroit, Michigan. And good to see everyone. Uh, I do apologize in advance if uh, this information has already been covered, but I wanted to ask uh, why so many are maybe unfamiliar with the role of the deaconess, de uh, uh, seeing that we have biblical um, persons, the figures in the Bible, such as Phoebe. <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, why are we unfamiliar with this role? Because we don't see it. Okay, We don't see 
It's a kind of a, almost a failure of our imagination. We don't see women being ministering or being ministered to in these capacities. So our horizon for um, even uh, uh, assessing that is in a vacuum. Okay. So there's always how does history become alive? How do we understand the um, uh, the, uh, the biblical inheritance that we have received. I talk, spoke before about the power of the sacramental life, but it's also just the power of the living tradition of the church. And if that living tradition is somehow stymied, then what we consider to be an important aspect of our tradition get lost because we don't experience them. We don't see them. So um, I think part of it is just education, but the other part is actually um, expanding our, our imagination to what could be in the church, and how then looking at, the, even within the history of the church, we can then um, meet those demands and meet those needs that we in fact have. So part of it is, as I said before, just educating that this is part of our tradition, and then how we can envision seeing it continue to be part of our tradition in concrete ways, ways that are particular to the ministerial aspects that are not being, um, uh, that we perhaps are not fulfilling in ministering to you these days. Okay, thank you for your question. Father Elijah. Um, my question is, so uh, what I s sort of see here is that you are two, two linking, sentences. Two sentences. Yeah, <laughs> linking the diaconate to the mission of the church. If you could just expand a little bit on the idea of the church and mission and how how expanding the diaconate would be good for that, especially you know, the, the, the diaconate of women? I think two aspects <coughs> come to my mind initially. One is um, our own integrity. And by that, I mean, for instance, an ecumenical dialogue. You know, people in ecumenical dialogue admire the Orthodox for our rich history and our rich um, expression of encounter with, with, um, with Christ through the Holy Spirit, Trinitarian language, we highly developed, they love generally uh, often the tradition of the patristic inheritance that we have, but they also see a church that talks about women in glowing terms, but never sees it. It's a sea of black, and the dresses are all worn by men. But so, I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, and, and for, in, for instance, the same thing used to come up with Father Alexander Schmemann when he would, uh, one of the great liturgical uh, renewal uh, scholars in our day, when he would encounter um, uh, people in the ecumenical diet, and he would, he would speak glowingly of the importance of the Eucharist in our receiving communion in our lives, and they would say to them, that's wonderful, Father, but none of your people actually receive communion, maybe once a year. And it was from that idea that you took the idea that, we, that living up to our own theology matters, and it's showing other people by our actions that this is really what we believe, not just saying what we believe. Okay, so that's one aspect of the mission that I would um, like to uplift. The second is the whole philanthropic aspect of our liturgical service should be connected to, in fact, um, the outside world. In the early church, everybody brought these gifts, all the food, right? They are blessed, and then they are taken and distributed to the poor, to the sick, to who was out there, okay? I mean, we can retain these little remnants of that, and that was the function of the deacon or deaconess, the deaconess in more of a private sphere. So if you can imagine, for instance, as a liturgical scholar myself, if you can imagine a great entrance where it's not just the chalice, but at the end of the line we have baskets of food and things that are bringing up and maybe stood at the foot of the salea, and then perhaps when the antidote is blessed after the anaphora, we bless those food things as well. We did this once with our church school kids, so this is I'm relaying to you what we did once for our retreat. Then we had all of them, after the end of the service, take all that food out, and because we're urban parish, we were right on the street with a bunch of homeless and giving out that food. Now what an incredible mission and ministry and kind of face of the church that is not just social service but connected to our liturgical life that we could in fact show the world. And that was part of the diaconal ministry of the church that is closely tied with liturgical renewal so we can't maybe do everything. But that was it's the one concrete example that we actually did and that I can relay had a very positive uh, effect 
in terms of our wealth. And in, in addition to that, we didn't just give them food, we talked to them, we ministered to them, we spoke to them as kind of people. So it wasn't just like handouts kind of thing. And you need trained people oftentimes to actually do engage and encounter um, some of the problems that people have in the strength of the church. So those are kind of the missionary aspects. So they, if, I, if they have questions about orthodoxy, we can properly you know, address them kind of thing um, and allow us to then you know, to actually um, Christianize all of the world. We're here to transfigure the entire world. So I think that that's a one way of doing it. Um, hello, um, I'm Georgia Mahos, and this is my name here, St. Peter You mentioned schism, the slippery slope to the presbytery. What are the arguments that are being made against women deacons? Those are the arguments being made against women. <laughs> yeah, she asked, what are the arguments against? Those are the arguments against. That it will automatically lead to women in the priesthood, and that somehow it will split the church. Well, that the split the church is a little... People don't generally make that argument aloud. The, big, the major fear is that this will lead to uh, women priests, women bishops tomorrow, and that somehow everything else will fall apart because that would be the case. And my point is that that's ignoring the history of the church, that's ignoring the understanding of the diaconate as its own particular role. It's not the same as the priesthood. The priesthood is a sacerdotal ministry. It's the one that gives the offering, you know, the priest and the, and the bishop. There is a distinction between the, the, um, what we call the priesthood, essentially the presbytery and the episcopacy, that is much, they're much closer tied together than the deacon, okay? And we have, to under, we have to explain to people the difference in these ministries. They are distinct. One is not just a stepping stone to the other, okay? And, but what do we see? What do we see? Especially in, for instance, the Greek archdiocese. How long are these people deacons? What do they do as deacons? They're deacon one day, priest the next. Okay? In the Slavic uh, churches, generally you do have more permanent deacons, but what do they see? They see them just serving as liturgical functionaries, just censor swingers, okay? That makes sense. Do they see them going out, ministering to the poor, visiting the sick, taking communion? Do they, they don't see any of that. So if we can understand the diaconate as a ministry that is, that that we are only really seeing and experiencing in a very, very reduced form. We can appreciate the expansiveness and the importance of just diaconal ministry in general. Then we can see women filling these roles, not just as the specific gifts that we as humans may bring, but for some particular ministries, especially women to women ministries that are no, not as uh, present being addressed. Can I ask a follow on? How do we know that the arguments for female deaconesses are not the prevailing um, well, as we get so, so the question was, how do we know that the arguments used are not the prevailing view? The arguments for are not, in other words, how do we know that that things that I've articulated positively for the women, the renewal of the female diaconate, are not what most people think, as opposed to the um, arguments articulated against? Is that a correct uh, right. restatement yeah. of your yeah. question? Okay. Um, I think, well, first of all, we don't know, okay? Secondly, I would say that if given the arguments um, in favor, I think many people, especially those at the parish level, agree. And they can understand through their own experience and through their own um, uh, maybe pastoral needs in their own lives how this could be a very good benefit to the church. <laughs> However, they are drowned out very loudly by people on the internet who are from the opposing <laughs> view, um, who share a set of um, uh, presuppositions and qualities that um, perhaps not all of us uh, share. And the bishops, anything else, they hate controversy. They like things to be settled in their, <laughs> in their realm kind of thing. So I think it is incumbent to us to just continue to work and to point out the positive aspects of this ministry and ways that we can then fulfill and build up the body of Christ. And it's only through continuing to do that that we'll be able to um, put the groundswell and to, to answer George Crocasius's question, will allow the bishops the space to then lead us forward. Okay, Valerie asked if she could make one comment yeah, and then we have uh, uh, responses to that to add to. One, 
within the academic world, within those of us who actually work with early Christian texts and Byzantine materials and all, overwhelmingly we understand these texts this way. So when you say, how do we know it's not the majority, it is the majority view among those who are experts. It's overwhelmingly the majority view. Secondly, um, those who are contrary <laughs> Uh, have their own way of interpreting texts. And that is something that you have to realize, and, and part of that means that they're incorporating into it or they're inserting into it um, ideas and theologies that are somewhat foreign to traditional orthodoxy, like the Protestant male headship and, you know, um, th th seriously, that's, that's becoming one of the also major arguments against the female diaconate. Um, Last question, Mary Well, I, you were asking about the missions of, of diaconate missions. I mean, they just ordained five deaconesses. It's questionable how they ordained them in the Congo as missionaries. Yeah, right, the Patriarchate of Alexandra. I'm just saying. And I do have other things that I want to say, but I'm just say that offline. Okay, uh, with that, we're going to end uh, this discussion. Let's thank Tabo with a fabulous <laughs>